Welcome to another session of the Expanded States of Consciousness Summit. I'm Ron Siegel, a clinical psychologist at Harvard Medical School in the USA, and I'll be your co-host for this session. Today, I have the great pleasure of interviewing my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Chris Willard. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Ron. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for joining the summit. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And uh, before we dive in, I'd like to give people a little bit of background um, about your work for those who aren't familiar. So Dr. Chris Willard is a clinical psychologist, educational consultant, and author based in the Boston area, specializing in mindfulness practices. He's been practicing meditation for over 20 years and has led hundreds of workshops around the world with invitations from more than 30 countries. Chris has presented at two TEDx conferences, and his thoughts have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Mindful.org, and elsewhere. He's author of Alpha Breaths, Growing Up Mindful, and How We Grow Through What We Go Through, as well as eight other books for parents, professionals, and children available in more than 10 languages. He also offers online courses of Growing Up Mindful and Bringing Up Bodhisattvas, as well as serving with me on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. As you'll soon see, Chris is a real pioneer in developing mindfulness practices for kids and finding novel ways to engage them in practices. So he's had a lot of experience helping kids to develop certain kinds of expanded states of consciousness. And I'm really eager to explore with him the relationship between these expanded states, the states we adults experience with mindfulness and other practices, and what normal consciousness consciousness looks like in childhood and at other developmental stages. So uh, welcome again, Chris, and I'll I'll jump right in with the first question that, that I had thinking about your work and thinking about expanded states. And that's that, you know, when we're exploring mindfulness in particular as an expanded state, um, the words of the Zen master Shunru Suzuki are often quoted. And he famously said, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. And very often this beginner's mind is described as being childlike in the sense of being curious and open. And yet little kids can be very self-focused at times, concerned with getting their desires fulfilled right now, right? I want it, right? And, you know, we we don't see, you know, a two-year-old tantrum as the usual desired fruit of meditation practice. (laughs) So how how can we understand this? How can we understand the similarities and differences between this kind of beginner's mind, this attitude we're trying to get to in, in the expanded states that mindfulness practice brings and kind of normal consciousness in the little kid world? Yeah, I think I think this is such a fun question. I've had a lot of fun kind of thinking about this over time. Like our are young people actually mindful? I mean, in a sense, they're in the moment, but in another sense, like the moment is all, it's like, no, I need this now. I want this now. And that's very different in some ways than like being in the moment and having no cares about the past or the future. And it's also a good demonstration of like, how much, you know, sort of being in the moment in a sense can be sort of a a disaster um, in terms of planning or what we might in the psychology world call the executive function, right? That a a young person can't actually see the future, that the, the brain is not fully developed to anticipate consequences of behaviors or have an attention span that lasts particularly long. I was just um, running a conference last weekend and saw a kind of, uh, I actually should have, uh, should have looked for it before this, but a kind of you know, it was, it was like a horror movie slide of like how how terrible everyone's executive functions have been since the pandemic, but also looking at kids and how little they can actually anticipate the future. You know, even by adolescence, just, you know, a week or two really, you know, to kind of understand impact of, of, of behavior or impact of a, a decision or choice or something like that. And so on the one hand, like that's, well, that's being in the moment. On the other hand, like that's no way to live either, right? But, but I do think that the idea of beginner's mind, it, to me, what it really means is, is and, and also I would say one of the things about development and exploring different states of consciousness is that my understanding of all of these wisdoms keeps deepening and keeps changing. So I used to have one idea about what beginner's mind meant Mm, and that continues to evolve. And I think we have to recognize that as our own consciousness evolves and actually our understandings of things that made sense to us at one point in our development, spiritual development, personal development, chronological development, um, you know, start to start to shift as well. But thinking about this idea, uh, to, to me, what it means is, 
it, being able to see things without the prejudgments, without the cultural values that have been placed on things, um, ideas like just a, a really straightforward and simple um, curiosity. I've gotten really interested in what 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 is curiosity? How does curiosity relate to mindfulness? How does it relate to states like awe? Um, this sort of openness of, of of experience that I think many things cultivate. You know, one of which is mindfulness, and you know, I know there's other conversations about other kinds of things that that open us up to remove some of that. Like, what's the cultural lens that that we yeah. placed on things? What are the things that we've learned, which then impact how we see and perceive the world based on our experiences, based on caregivers, based on culture to a large extent as well, as well as based on, you know, our, our, our development, our neurological development, our um, hormonal development, these other things that impact our perceptions and what, what, what it means to have, I guess, evolving stage of consciousness over the course of a lifetime. Yeah. Well, no, because it's really interesting because expanded, when we think of expanded states of consciousness, we're usually thinking of things like awe, right? Mm -hmm. And we're thinking of things like openness. And we are thinking about, and we are describing states in which cultural conditioning isn't playing a huge role, right? Uh, I mean, even though when somebody experiences an expanded state, they might experience it, you know, based on our cultural background as um, connecting with God, you know, uh, now that's a, a cultural predisposition that gives us the construct of God, right? Or, and somebody else would say, no, it's connecting to the nature or the ground of being or awareness itself. So culture plays a role in how we interpret these, but these states are, are large, that's how we interpret them. They are largely free of that. There's something that's not about the usual thought stream and the conceptual world in most of these expanded states. And yet, you know, I, I know Jack Cornfield has this uh, um, little riff. I'm not going to reproduce it uh, perfectly, but it's basically if you're fully in the present moment, uh, just with the sensations that are happening here and now, um, open to um, whatever experience and not lost in thoughts of the past and the future, you're probably a dog. <laughs> so, you know, so, so, um, so which. You know, begs the question. I mean, kids are human, obviously, but they're a different kind of human, right? And they are in the moment, but also, as you're saying, not with the executive functioning capacities, um, which also brings a, a whole other question, which is do expanded states generally require the suspension of executive functions while we're in those states? I don't know. What do you think about that? Actually, that's a that's an interesting question, and I, I think about what I, when I think about what helps me get into the moment. And again, we also have a different idea of what what that even means. I think about our senses being very powerful. Like our, our senses are a direct line to our experience, right? What do I see? You know, without the story of building brown square, I'm looking out my window right now across across Cambridge, right? Or what do I hear without, you know, you know, just can I let this sound land on me without thinking horn and then leading it to a story like, oh, central square, God knows what's going on. The traffic is terrible, right? All those things. So our senses bring us right in. And if we can experience things in our senses, which I do think there is something about childlike states of wonder that do that, or, you know, also other expanded states of consciousness where we become much more engrossed in, engaged in, engaged by our, our five senses, basically, that, that that in fact is a way to access some of these states before we then talk about, you know, what, what is culture, what is the narrative, what is the story that you've created in conjunction with, with other people and with the larger world that has that shaped how you then tell this story about this sensory experience, right? Safety or danger, right? Being one of those. And some of those may be, of course, hardwired into us. But I, I actually totally lost track of what your question was, Ron. Yeah, no, well, but <laughs> you're, 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 um, you, you, you are still onto it. it it's, it's sort of, you know, because, uh, you know, a dog, to come back to... Oh, right, the dog, yeah. Next story. Uh, you know, a dog is, um, is very much in the present moment, and they're very much with, we presume, with sensory experience, right? When they're, right. you know, sniffing or, or chowing down on something and they're not thinking about past and future so much, but very much like ki kids, they're also 
quite at the mercy of their desires, right? right. You know, that's right. that that's perhaps uh, you know, as you talk about this, that's perhaps the biggest difference. That you know, when we have these expanded states brought about through contemplative practice, part of what we're learning to do is not just compulsively act on desires and. Um, in fact, I think when you're teaching mindfulness to kids, that's one of the skills that you're trying to add in, right? Not just mm-hmm. how to be with the sensation, but how to also not act compulsively and impulsively on desires. Right, right. And how to not, and, and I think how do we achieve, whether adults or kids, you know, some kind of more, I hate to say natural, but more kind of inborn and innate state of openness without also just being pure id, pure amygdala limbic system, you know, react, not respond. So I think there's a bit of a catch-22 or some kind of almost like koan as we look at this, like what is it that we're trying to cultivate? Can we cultivate both of these? I, I think about the dog too, actually, this, this, this here's some some kid wisdom. Um, I think a lot of us who are interested in mindfulness, we know that sort of that, that picture of like the human being and the dog and the human being has all the traffic and stuff in their mind and the dog is just sort of seeing the sunshine and the trees, you know, this this cartoon. And I was showing this to some teenagers and this this kid said, oh, Dr. Willard, like the human being, like they're about to step in the dog shit. And I was like, well, that you know, mindfulness is not like sunshine and rainbows and everything's wonderful. It's like you got to see the reality of, you know, the beautiful things in the world, which our negativity bias prevents us from seeing, or we don't tend to perceive that as often as the negative. But we also have to, we still have to see the negative and not override every negative perception that we have either, right? So that we can avoid stepping in the dog shit. And so where do we then, like, when are our, and and that's, that's our limbic system that says, watch out, you're about to step in dog shit. How do we then you know, keep that active enough that it's not taking over, right? But at the same time, not have it steer everything in a way that's that's not helpful, and all of which we know end up inhibiting more insight, more contemplation, more reflection. And that is then where, you know, being able to access these states in the right way to turn them on, hopefully, to turn them off, hopefully, when it's useful, um, I feel like is important, you know, and we might call that in child development, we might call that self regulation, or, you know, kind of terms like that. But I, I do think that um, there's something to look at both in terms of the, you know, how are we creating, how, how are we removing acculturation where it's not so helpful? But how are we also, you know, like our trauma reactions are, you know, these other kinds of things that we walk around in the world with or, you know, not so helpful things that we've we've learned from our parents or caregivers or society. But at the same time, you know, we do need some some of that stuff to keep ourselves safe, um, yeah. to keep ourselves. Well, well, well and, and, and there's an you know, it's making me reflect as you talk about this, that that most expanded states of consciousness are also kind of open to shadow elements. They're also open yeah. to past pain. They're, uh, the openness and curiosity isn't just about the beautiful flower here, right. but it's also an openness and curiosity about the difficulties in in human life. And it's also true that kids don't necessarily gravitate toward that. You and I have both done child therapy for many years and boy, you know, kids don't want to talk about the difficult stuff, right? They, <laughs> right, really, you know, right. they really want to go off, you know, toward what is pleasant because they're, because they are a little bit more pleasure seeking instinct yeah. oriented. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. so, so, um, you know, let me ask you about this. The, um, uh, you know, while mindfulness practices can be used to reduce stress and and often are, and to take a breath, right, to not act impulsively, as as we've been talking about on um, on every desire that comes up. You know, in their origins in Buddhist traditions, they're designed also for this rather radical enterprise that's very connected with expanded states of really seeing how the self is constructed, seeing the impermanence and fluidity of all things, and really seeing the the futility of grasping at trying to gratify desires as a path to well-being, the kind of, you know, id-oriented approach that that you were talking about. Um, So you've seen the effects of mindfulness on kids at all sorts of different ages. How might the effects be different on little kids than slightly older kids or adolescents? You know, what, what have you observed? Yeah, I, I mean, to me, I think how, you know, I, I go back and forth. I'm a, I sort of got started in 
this tradition, the contemplative world, mostly with with Thich Nhat Hanh and, and his community and, and retreats when I was um, like about 20, 22 years old with, I like to say, all, all of the rights of adulthood with none of the responsibilities, <laughs> um, which is what that age is. And, and still actually in many ways adolescent, right? We know about the brain doesn't really finish, especially in young men till age 25 or 28. But, but thinking about, um, you know, looking at, you know, like how, how, how you know, what, what, what that did for me, um, but then also looking back at other things that I've seen in young people. And Thich Nhat Hanh talks about, or talked about, um, you know, mindfulness with kids is like planting seeds. And I, and I always found that metaphor to be really powerful. But I've come to also start to wonder, is it actually just watering the seeds that are already there <laughs> and pruning in some ways um, these, these cultural constructs and, and biases and misperceptions that, that, again, get acculturated into kids through their experiences um, with others through challenging experiences that they've had, as well as through positive ones that they've had, as well as just sort of the way that we acculturate kids to, you know, like, well, now it's time to plan for the future and think about your college or think about, you know, this, this and this. And so I do think it's an interesting question, like, are kids innately mindful? If they are, then what are we teaching them? Are we teaching them how to preserve, maintain and reaccess that mindfulness that's already there, which I think is actually a question we ask adults too, right? It's, you know, in the Buddhist sense, it's like, how do you uncover and reaccess your internal Buddha nature, right? Or, or something like that, right? How do you how do you unlearn rather than how do you learn mm -hmm. is, I think, what a lot of wisdom traditions, actually, not just Buddhism, start to point us toward is, is unlearning rather than than learning. Yeah, un uncovering a basic wise, insane being that's in there that that gets obfuscated by all of our hurts and all of our plans and strategies and that kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. So it's interesting to think whether you know we're we're doing that with kids because we are doing that and also though teaching them skills like um, you know how to not just grab the cook the proverbial cookie right and and <laughs> right. you know and and uh, it's interesting as you talk about this you know I think so many times people will. Um, reference childhood experiences of, you know, what it used to be like lying in the grass, um, what it used to be like uh, sitting by the stream. You know, people will have these these profound senses of, yeah, somehow I knew how to be in the sensory world and not be in my thought stream when I was a kid, and I have a, a reference to that. So part of it is is reconnecting. With yeah. that, right? Uh, you know, as, as you talk about um, it's sort of removing the obstacles. And this often comes up in workshops and working with adults around sharing mindfulness with kids is, is I'll often share sort of my, my origin story, you know, when I was young of like, let's walk as silently as we can in the woods. Let's notice all the sounds in the forest with, you know, at this camp that's actually in your backyard, around by the Drumlin Farm. Um, right? And, you know, the counselors are maybe trying to get us to, to shut up, but it was actually this really profound, oh my gosh, like I'm not focused on anything but my feet if I'm trying to walk silently. I am noticing all these sounds and what I thought was silence. So there was some kind of moment of awakening that actually really did start. Was that the planting of a seed? Was that the watering of a seed at that point, right? And I think, you know, and then asking adults, what were their more, and, you know, again, when we teach people anything, we want to build on existing knowledge. That's just good pedagogy. But what were experiences perhaps of mindfulness before you heard the word mindfulness or of awe before you sort of read, you know, a, a book about it or, or something like that? I do think these are good provocative questions to, to ask adults as well. Um, and I think like the, the traditional wisdom I did some writing actually a few years ago about, um, you know, parallels between Buddhism and contemporary child development research. And, and the cookie thing just reminded me because many of us are familiar with the marshmallow test, right? <laughs> like, you know, can you delay gratification enough to get the second marshmallow? The yeah, second maybe, effort? maybe tell people what it is who aren't psychologists, you know? Yeah. So the, 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 the back in the seventies at Stanford, um, they'd offer some kids, you can have one marshmallow now and then the Confederate, the test you know, so experiment grad student would leave the room and say, Oh, I, I gotta go. You know, you know, just don't eat the marshmallow. If I come back, you can have two. And so many of these kids then were like oh, two marshmallows, like I'll wait. Right. So then they saw this this research down the road that showed, right, the kids that could wait for the marshmallow. Right. They this, were for able, the two marshmallows where it was right, where, where delaying the gratification to get the two. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. So this had you know correlations with you know greater success on various measures later in life. And I, I think about this on a, on a few different levels. I mean, there's executive function stuff. There's also a lot of you know class and culture stuff that's been kind of reread into these studies since then. But but I think about this as like the the Buddha, you know, like delayed gratification enough to get get enlightenment despite the temptations of of Mara, right? You know, saying no, eat the marshmallow, I'll give you unlimited power, right? And also the idea being not that two marshmallows is always better. The idea being sometimes one marshmallow is enough, and sometimes you want two. You know, liberation is can you have one and enjoy it, or can you wait for two if you want to, right? Which do you need? In that moment, so sort of noticing these are the ways also that the Buddha, you know, I think those of us that have maybe read Carol Dweck's work around mindsets, right? This sort of idea of a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. I think about this too with the Buddha, like he was a real growth mindset guy. Like there was, you know, back then in, in the in the Hindu sort of understanding of the world, right? You're always being reborn, reborn, reborn. There's no escape, right? That's a real fixed mindset view. The Buddha said, no, there is an escape. We can get off this, this wheel, right? With this, which is what he discovered when he was sitting under the Bodhi tree waiting for his, his marshmallow of liberation. Um, so yeah, it just sort of reminded me of these other parallels that I've, I've seen kind of between some of our more famous, um, uh, stories from from Buddhism, as as well as some of our more famous studies that we have from child development, which I know I apologize for getting a little wonky here. These aren't familiar to everybody listening. No, but no, but it's it's it's, it's it's it is really interesting because you know that was that was a big part of the Buddha's innovation was you know to just sit there for those forty nine days and nights and open to whatever came, both you know intense temptations of of lovely things and horribly scary demonic things and realized that if he could say yes to all of those, he found a kind of equanimity and peace and a really profoundly expanded state of consciousness that was really a state of egolessness is what arose from not pursuing these things. So I, I think you're onto something. I think there's a direct connection between, you know, sort of Michelle's studies at, at Stanford of can we not compulsively grab the marshmallow and <laughs> and expanded states of enlightenment. It's so interesting because that part of it is not the part that comes so naturally to kids, right? As, <laughs> right. as, as we've been saying. The <laughs> other part of really savoring the marshmallow or really lying in the grass and touching it, that does come naturally to kids and we're trying to uncover that. So it it, it may be, as I'm hearing you talk, that, that there are some new skills that we're trying to develop as we lo- lead kids toward expanded states. And also we're trying to uncover and reinforce or water the seeds, as you said, of some things that are quite naturally there. Because I don't think that delaying gratification as I look around the animal world, that, there doesn't seem to be a lot of instinct for that. <laughs> right, right, right. Even if you look around the human world, there's not. Yeah, look around the human world, there doesn't seem to be a lot of instinct for that either as we're, you know, as we, as we're addicted to our, our phones. Um, you know, um, in, in the series on expanded states, you know, a lot of us who have worked with uh, certainly pursuing mindfulness practice or those in the psychedelic assisted psychotherapy world or other people exploring the, um, the the potential benefits of various expanded states have had some personal experiences of ourselves that were either transformative or that, um, uh, you know, that helped shape our traje- tra- trajectories. I-, I wonder if you might share any of those for you in terms of both what got you interested in this stuff and also any that have been particularly, um, that have that have yielded insights that have been particularly important to you. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I, I certainly, when I was younger, you know, in, in high school and my not fully developed brain did a lot of <laughs> experimentation and, and sometimes beyond and had a number of, of psychedelic experiences that, that I look back with gratitude on and feel like those were, those actually opened my mind in a, in a lot of powerful ways. Um, I then also continued to explore many substances to the point of real problematic addiction um, in ways that were, you know, then very unhelpful to me. Um, and I think also, you know, a, a sort of that that age, that kind of like late adolescence and, and early adulthood, we do open to we. I, I think 
maybe evolutionarily, you know, I know, you know, I've heard like, you know, Dan Siegel talk about this, but evolutionarily, we are supposed to be open to all kinds of new experiences that this is this is wired into us. I think evolutionary psychology has a lot to say about this. But but and again, reconnecting with other other natural states. I mean, just to um, I don't want to like shoehorn back to this, but I, I thinking also about the Buddha, you know, he, you know, grew up in a very sheltered, you know, we, you know, what gated community basically, right. <laughs> Went out with, you know, his, basically his nanny, right. And, and encountered suffering. I think a lot actually about my own experiences, you know, grew up in a pretty sheltered world, went off to college and like many people, you know, came back, you know, kind of like a campus radical. Like I, I encountered, oh my gosh, there's suffering in this world. Now I'm going to liberate anybody, everybody. And I'm like fired up politically and for social justice and all this stuff. Not unlike the Buddha, right? Encounter suffering. It can either turn into cynicism and denial or it can turn into, oh my gosh, I want to help other people. And that was a little bit of my journey. And I think that some of the substance altered states of consciousness actually did help me open my eyes to some of that suffering and then have a desire to alleviate that suffering. I did then spend too much time drinking and doing heroin, which really then limited my ability to go out and actually help other people. Um, Yeah. Well, well, which raises something very interesting that there, you know, that certain pharmaceuticals may predispose themselves toward expanded states and others uh, useful expanded states and others not so much, right? That they right, they, right. they they create other kinds of states that are um, maybe pleasant, yes, but but not necessarily um, so use, useful for our development. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And 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 that ended up, you know, is where I got kind of caught um, for a long time. Is in that kind of hungry hungry ghost cycle to go back to to Buddhism too. Um, what was interesting is that's actually when I first started reading a little bit more, I was actually reading, oh my gosh, it might've been like Andrew Weil's book from 25 years ago. Um, but I learned a little bit about Ibogaine, which I never tried, but was very curious about it because there was actually some some anecdotal and some research at that point on Ibogaine being helpful, particularly for opiates, but also other addictions um, in terms of leading to more insight and then changes in behavior. Um, I ended up getting getting sober then 20 some years ago. And and that also feels in some ways like in our society to be an altered state of consciousness where like, man, like that there there's always an like there's nothing that takes the edge off, which is challenging in this world. Um, and yet also has been, you know, I basically my parents dragged me my first. I don't even know if you know the, the details of this story, Ron, despite our friendship. Basically, like a day or two off of opiates, my parents dragged me onto a retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm-hmm. And that then was like, you know, it was like in withdrawal and having my mind blown by these incredible practices. And in some ways, withdrawal probably does have its own um expanded state of consciousness as well. We know that there are massive chemical changes happening, um, you know, when when someone is going through withdrawal from a number of different physically addictive um, substances that's that's interesting and can lead to insights, not just, you know, that are deeper than like, oh my gosh, this feels terrible. I don't want to experience right. it again. Right. But in terms of, for me, what actually happened on that retreat was thinking, was, was you know, what Thich Nhat Hanh, teaches taught so much was interbeing right where did this raising come from all of that and what i was able to see on that retreat was actually thinking i mean i was sort of one of those like insufferable like i do drugs from you know they were smuggled in in you know inside someone's butt you know or whatever probably put that into my bloodstream but oh i'm a vegetarian and only eat organic food i was that guy right totally insufferable and yet suddenly realizing oh my gosh like i had this insight of This isn't just damaging to me or to my friends and family, but actually me continuing to do drugs like this is actually perpetuating conflict in Colombia or Mexico or, you know, sort of thinking about actually the the inter the the ripple interpersonally in terms of interbeing of the way I was consuming things because, oh my gosh, I was an, you know, insufferably moralistic about what kind of food I would consume, you know, as a sort of young social justice activist, but, you know, don't tell me, you know, but, but I hadn't actually thought about that in terms of the, the substances I was consuming and the negative impact that they were having on the world in terms of 
whether it was you know local policing and the war on drugs in the USA, or whether it was thinking more globally in terms of the impact. And that was a really profound thing that had never struck me until I was on that retreat with Thich Nhat Hanh yeah. a day or two <laughs> off of heroin. So it's a funny story about like, why did you get sober? Well, I start to see the, the global impact. Not And, and you know, it's, it's all those reasons. It's multi- Well, well I, I think, I, I, you know, I, I think when we, you know, when we see things like Ibogaine or, you know, other psychedelics being used to help people with, um, with substance use disorders, um, it is about this, it, you know. It, it you know it, it's it's not a you know Bill W who founded AA. He had an LSD trip that gave him a sense of interbeing of the of interconnectedness with with other people in the rest of the world, and that's how the higher power became part of twelve step program. So mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I, I think it's it's actually quite consistent with that. What happened to you um, in, in a in a really useful way that when we when we can actually get it that it's not all just about me, right. because we actually viscerally feel as happens in expanded states so often, actually viscerally feel the interconnection with others and the world at large, then that shifts that shifts our motivations and it shifts shifts what we want to be doing with our lives. So that's it's it's very, very powerful what you're uh what you're saying. And and it's also very interesting, you know, when you 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 said in passing, but that a commitment to sobriety is a kind of commitment to uh, a non-ordinary state, right? <laughs> given, given, given how often people self-medicate uh, right, right. with with medicines, and and it's very interesting because it loops right back to the marshmallow experiment, right? Because yeah, sobriety, right. It, you know, a commitment to sobriety is saying, okay, when I feel psychological distress and I have the impulse to self-medicate, even in a very socially accepted way by you know having a you know glass of wine or, or a beer um now i'm not going to do that because i found that that's not helpful for me but then how that opens us up to all sorts of exploration of what this unpleasant state is about in a way that we'd never get to see it with that kind of clarity if it weren't for the the commitment to sobriety which is like the buddha sitting under the bodhi tree and saying no i'm just gonna sit here and yeah. be with whatever comes up so i this is yeah. all quite interestingly connected um i think as you talk about it yeah yeah I, I i do think about that sometimes like there's it's it's a challenge and i think also we can look at different cultures and you know certainly in the muslim world there's a taboo around drinking but there's less so around hashish like you know mm-hmm. when i was in indonesia a few years ago it was like, oh, there's a massive market for MDMA here, despite alcohol being taboo. It was just like humans want to want to get out of their own heads and want to get out of their own yeah. skin, and, and sometimes that's about liberation, right? And some and 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 um, and true liberation and insight, you know, insight based liberation, right? Do the substance, do this thing, so that maybe I don't have to anymore because I've had enough insights that I can then create some transformation. And sometimes it is just about escape, but that there is something clearly evolutionarily wired into us about um, wanting to change our our state of consciousness from yeah. this. I wouldn't say mundane human experience because it's not mundane. It's it's challenging. It's painful. It's, yeah, it's from this challenging human experience of but but our our normal being kind of caught in our normal narratives and and yeah. desires and fears and the like. You know? Yeah, because all these expanded states. Again, we might separate the ones that are sort of more dulling, if you will. And, you know, that's really easy to understand. You know, benzodiazepines, opiates, alcohol, they right. tend to be dulling. It's kind of easy to see. All right, that's about getting the pain to be reduced. But a lot of these others are also about can I somehow shift my perspective radically enough to get to get relief that comes from that? And and as I think about this. And and your work with kids and mindfulness and 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 you know thinking developmentally, what do you think? Are there are there certain developmental periods in which expanded states of consciousness are more likely useful? Or and where are the downsides? Where are the ways in which I mean you're sort of alluding to it a little bit, like it it became a derailment for you at you know mm-hmm. at, at a certain point. But are there general principles here about you know when is it you know not so helpful? to be helping, say, young people uh, to explore expanded states? And when might it be more helpful? Or is it a matter of how we do it? Or uh, how, how might we think about this? Yeah, I think I think across the lifespan, there are different 
you know, whether you believe in you know, like Eric Erickson or Freud's, you know, very, and again, we're, we're shrinks here. So we're, t- we're kind of insider baseball here, but you know, these researchers or, or old therapists and, and psychologists who said, you know, this happens at this stage, this happens at this stage sort of across the, the lifespan. I do believe that there are these junctures that we all face in our life. Um, and, and I do think there are times when our brains also probably evolutionarily open up, right? As I mentioned, like they do open up and change a lot in adolescence. Like we are supposed to take more risks. There's a reason for that um, in adolescence. And then hopefully we, we don't go so far out that we then die, right? But then we learn and we pass on, you know, our wisdom and our genes to the next generation to look at the evolutionary perspective. So I do think that there are, are phases in life when this is, is really helpful, when there are a lot of questions. Um, you know, most of my knowledge in terms of the psychedelics, you know, I've read a few of the books and I really enjoyed uh, um, the guy who writes about food. Oh, the, um, Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan. So, you know, I've, I've, I've loved all of his you know books about food. I read that book and found it very compelling thinking about just other phases in life, like, you know, whether it's thinking about end of life, you know, watching my mom die and my, my family grieve and thinking, you know, sort of knowing that that was coming, like feeling like that actually could be really helpful for um, my parents at this phase in life, maybe for me, you know, and I, and I wonder about this at different phases in life. He also mentioned sort of ideas about kind of at the midlife being an interesting opportunity to create some kind of ritual in some ways. And we certainly see articles about, about this and, um, you know, this article, in the post maybe or the the times the other day about moms microdosing for postpartum depression and and having more insights into that phase in life so i do feel like there are times that we are naturally supposed to open and that maybe there are also for whatever traumas and reasons and hurts and, and acculturation we have not been invited to open and i think that whether it's mindfulness practices contemplative practices meditations whether it's um psychedelic assisted opening, I do feel like that there are phases in life when things become very, very different. And actually having new insights and perspectives and expanded states of consciousness can be really valuable so that we don't keep doing the same thing. You can't act like a kid when you're a teenager. You can't Mm -hmm. act like you're a teenager when you're an adult. I mean, we see people do it, right? But it's usually not with very much success, right? You can't act like you know, I sort of I, I, I joked about, um, you know, trading my motorcycle in for a, a baby stroller, you know, like it's not responsible to to, to do that anymore in, in my life. Right. At other phases in life, there'll be other kinds of trades and insights that one needs for those different phases in life. And again, for some people, developmental scars or traumas keep them from opening at those different points in life. And so I think maybe there are reasons that these practices, these chemicals and substances can be really useful to give us the insights that we need for whatever the next next thing is in our life. Um, I mean, conversely, I'm wondering if there are also moments where, you know, we need to be more full steam ahead with executive functioning, more full steam ahead with learning basic social skills. Um, <laughs> you, you know, cause I, cause I think of child development and adolescent development, there are, um, you know, these, these kinds of wonderful insights that come from expanded states are really a different focus than are, okay, let me develop the courage to raise my hand and ask the question in class. Let me develop the courage to ask this other person out for a date if I want to get to know them and have romantic involvement. Let me learn how to prioritize what I need to do today and make sure I do the tasks that are due tomorrow before today. And you know, so many of these expanded states don't help us to do these things at all. Right. They, they, <laughs> right, you know, they, right. They, they, they may bring us into um, peaceful realms, they may bring us into uh, magical mystery tours, they may bring us into all sorts of things, but they don't, they don't help us lay down these, these basic skills. And, uh, uh, you know, I wonder, you, you, you know, are, are there times where, where we really don't want to be expanding consciousness? Yeah, yeah. I think this is true. I think, and I think this is why we don't, unless we're monks, right, meditate at every moment or bring, you know, a a mindful, compassionate awareness to everything that that we do. Um, You know, it's also why we're not on 
you know, mind expanding substances all the time because it's 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 hard to function. <laughs> Executive functions go out the window. And it's and I think what's useful is being able to to shift safely between different states of consciousness to take what we can from one and to apply it then to the next and vice versa so that we can meet the moment with with, with what the moment is asking of us right and and i think whether it's taking insights from psychedelics insights from psychotherapy insights from books that we've read um and you know other you know or, or from awe inspiring experiences of being in nature and thinking oh my gosh i really want to sell my SUV and start bicycling or, you know, whatever it might be that we have these different insights and changes in our consciousness. Right. And then, and then continue to live in the world. I think that that's, that's what I think we need to figure out. And I think hopefully we are figuring out is, is what's the middle path here that allows us to live, but li and, and effectively not harm others. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And, and live with these insights and live with more, happiness, liberation, you know, whatever it might be that these expanded states can offer us. Yeah. Well, and you know, within those in a way that's safe, too. Yeah. And, and and along those lines, it occurs to me that, you know, that sometimes little kids can seem to be quite naturally wise and compassionate. Like I, I still have a very vivid memory of hiking with um, uh, with my daughters and one of them, we had come across, you know, a tree that had a, a branch. Um, uh, you know, uh, broken, but still attached. So it was clear that it was an injury. And, you know, as, as a little girl, she was, oh, you know, tree has a boo-boo and, you know, um, really having heartfelt compassion yeah. for the tree's experience of the limb being, being broken. Um, and yet as we get older, it's easy to lose that, right? It's, uh, you know, yeah. um, it's like, you know, much easier to see, oh, damn, now I got to step over the limb. It's in the trail. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, um, and I wonder what that's about. What, you know, it is uh, I'm, I'm sort of circling back around to this theme of, you know, to what degree are kids already enlightened, you know, or, or yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, is how come we we lose that open heart of compassion or often do. And is there a value to trying to keep it open or is that unrealistic that do, you know, does it have to um, fade for other developmental tasks to occur? And I think it's, I think it's context dependent. And I think in some ways it's, it depends on what a, what a child's growing into. I often, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking about the different sort of physiological states, right, we can be sort of open and, 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 and attend and, and, and befriend is kind of how I put it, right? But for a lot of kids or adults, like walking around with self-compassion, open-hearted through, you know, here I am in a fairly, you know, not uh, super safe feeling neighborhood, like that's, that's not actually safe, right? Yeah. So uh, to me, I think, I've been thinking about this too. I actually have a, a client who's working on a, a dissertation about what is therapy, basically, and, and when do you end? You know, what is what does it mean to be finished with therapy? And thinking it's to me, it's like when is there a choice, right? When is there a choice of when I can can I open my heart when it's useful to open my heart, and can I close it a little bit when it's safe to close it? But can I keep it as open as possible most of the time, right? Can yeah. I err on the side of of open but also safety? Likewise, I think with psychotherapy thinking like this was a really interesting question to me, like when like I I'm OK, you know, my therapist, I've seen him for a long time. He actually just retired, unfortunately. But thinking about this in terms of like, well, it's it's now therapy is a choice. It's not like uh, something I have to do. Right. And so I think, again, choice, just like do I want two marshmallows in 15 minutes or do I want to really enjoy this one marshmallow? To me, I think that. That is hopefully what we're teaching as we explore and teach and find ways to access these different states of consciousness is how can we, yeah, how can, how can we, how can we access them when, you know, as much as possible, I don't even want to say as much as possible, like, how can we. Well, when, I, I think I hear you saying, when is a particular attitude most well suited to the challenge of the moment, right? And that, that, that it's not one size fits all. When you were, when you were talking about that, I, I mean, you were talking about, you know, differences of, you know, of privilege of being in a safe neighborhood or not, or, or um, 
the like, but I was even thinking, you know, even in rather privileged environments, you know, like being open hearted about the, the branches boo boo when you're in a mean girl situation in middle school right. or when you're, right. you know, in the locker room um, in elementary school where the kids are ruthlessly torturing the kid who's overweight or who wasn't very coordinated. It's like, no, you know, this, right. is, you know, um, so maybe we need to develop those defenses be you know in childhood and then ultimately learn how to relinquish them when we're in safe sets safe environments and use the insights the, the insights of having massive amounts of compassion if it's if it's real skillful and not sort of doormat compassion is why is it that these kids are being bullies and i think that doesn't mean um, give them a break but i think if we can really have the cognitive and the affective kind of compassion and empathy for understanding why that other person is bullying in this world, then we can actually take a skillful action that can end that bullying. But it's not, but but we very few of us get there, right? We're usually yeah. more like, you know, we're either too soft with them or we're too we're too harsh with them. I mean, do you, um, do, do you yeah. find in 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 uh, working with teachers and 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 uh, teaching kids mindfulness that you can actually help even the kid who's in the middle of that to have that wise perspective of realizing, oh, well, this bully is doing this out of their own fears or their own stuff. Well, perspective taking is is also a, an expanded state of consciousness. We know that when we're under stress, our, you know, our prefrontal and insular cortices shut down where we're, where we're able to take other people's perspective and have what we call theory of mind, which is sort of understanding where someone else is coming from, at least at the cognitive level. And so actually helping someone then get into a more open, relaxed, yeah. mindful state or into their window of tolerance, whatever we want to call it, ventral vagal, as they as they call it in, in that model. But like what that can do is then actually open people up to take more perspective. Then the question is, what's the action that you take that's going to be skillful and useful? But I do think that helping kids to be able to understand that perspective. And we actually do know that with adults, I, I cite this study a lot when I'm working with educators is. The study where they're like suspending all these kids at some school and they then basically they ask the teachers, they're trying to reduce the number of disciplinary referrals. They ask the teachers, you have to think of before you write up the disciplinary slip and send them to the principal's office, you have to think of three reasons why the kid is acting this way. And it can't just be this kid's a pain in the ass. Mm. And what they found was that when the teachers did that, the number of referrals went down. Mm, that's a great, what a great intervention. That's brilliant. Yeah. It's it's amazing. And they did so and like, you know, my first thought was like, oh well, they just didn't want to do the paperwork, right? But they somehow ruled that out. Yeah, right, right. Um, but it was like, okay, maybe they're hungry, right? Maybe they didn't sleep because they were up taking care of their sick mom the night before, right? You know, so maybe I'll give them a note to go to the nurse's office and take a nap next period. Maybe I've got a granola bar on my desk I can give them. Maybe I'll give them a break, right? Because I know they probably got bullied on the bus or they have ADD or they have depression or they have, right? And so even just, and that's just really like a cognitive practice of can you open up for someone else's perspective and trying to do that with kids in an anti-bullying kind of way too. First, they have to feel safe. Then they can activate those regions of the yeah. brain associated with empathy and perspective taking. And then maybe they make a different choice or not, but at least you're inviting them into seeing something more than just that kid's a jerk who hates right. me. Or you know, and and yeah. and it's a very interesting point that you're making that that um, you know when teaching say mindfulness to kids and getting them to relax and open a bit and have that aspect of an expanded state that that actually allows for the perspective taking that actually allows for, you know, a whole shift in, uh, in, in understanding. And, you know, that, that, that's really highlighting a, a very important piece of expanded states that are not problematic for kids that are, that are, that actually support these, um, these, uh, important developmental, uh, steps that they need to take. Yeah. So I'm 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 conscious of the time. <laughs> I can keep uh, talking. You know, uh, no, <laughs> fascinating. I'm, Hopefully, I'm, other people are enjoying this. But I know we got a little down the psychology uh, jargon trail occasionally, but uh, well, you know, I, I think there's some I think there's some applicability to you know anybody who has ever been a kid or worked with kids <laughs> and uh, and is working with their own minds now, or hopefully so. Um, uh, if somebody would like to learn more about your work. Uh, um, where where should they go to check it out? 
Yeah, drchristopherwillard.com, drchristopherwillard.com, or on Instagram and other social media. I'm not on TikTok. I'm, I'm too old. Um, but uh, at Dr. Chris Willard, Dr. Chris Willard, and you can learn about some of the um, mindfulness courses that I teach, some of the uh, the uh, Bring Up Bodhisattvas, the Science and Spirit of Buddhist Parenting, a new course I'm just releasing, looking at more of these parallels too um, between the the spiritual and the, the psychological that we know about. So please stay in touch. And, and Ron, this has been a blast. Great to see you. And um, thank you all for, for listening. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you all for listening. And thanks so much, uh, Chris, for joining the series. Yeah, thanks.